Hello and welcome to our online service here at Sobel Christian Fellowship. You heard that right. This is only for you, our online audience. Starting today, we have opened up our doors for people to attend on Sunday morning, which is at a capacity of 15%, and we're really hoping that grows in the very near future. But also starting today, we're creating an online service just for you. That's right. Here's the thing. We're not going to pretend that what you're about to watch is happening live in the building. This was all pre-recorded on Thursday, and here's why. We want to give 100% of our effort, of our dedication and passion to our online audience. That's you. We also want to give 100% to the people in the building. We want both experiences to be engaging and powerful and encouraging and helpful. And so there are so many moving pieces to being able to live stream, to broadcast, to share, to pump out what's happening in the room that regrettably we haven't been able to give 100% to both. We're able to give 50%, literally splitting our efforts down the middle. Well, now we're giving 100% to both. So what you're watching is the same thing that the people in the church are experiencing. The same songs, the same message, the same announcements. We have a great host that if you just go over on that side, he's here ready to welcome you, to engage with you, to help you do. Thank you, Jackson Brotherton, for helping us host today. So we're going to get started in just a few short minutes. But in the meantime, welcome to SCF Online. Before we get into the service, we want to make you aware of a few things. As things start to open up and as meetings and programs and events start to become available, this is one way that you can find out what's going on. But please do not forget about our website, our events page, our social media places, and our weekly email that goes out every Thursday. But for now, my name is Andy. This is the Weekly Update! We have some exciting news for both kids and for parents. We have opened up our registrations for day camp this summer for kids JK to grade six, and this is happening from July 19th to 23rd. In order to accommodate everyone, we have three options for you. You can choose to attend the morning program, which is from 9.30 to noon, the evening program from 6 to 8.30, uh, and we're also providing an online option for you to participate from home. Space is limited, so visit our events page to register today. We still have two open slots for summer part-time employment. If you are someone, or if you know of someone who is between 15 and 30 years of age, and you're looking to work at a great church with a great team, uh, please contact our church office. The spot we did fill was for our children's ministry assistant. We'd love to take this moment right now and welcome Kyla Craven to our team. We're excited to have you here, Kyla, and we look forward to getting to know, getting to know you more around the office a little bit more. Okay, save the date, mark a calendar, start making a list of who you can invite. On June the 26th, we're having an all ages outdoor worship night here at the church. We are very much looking forward to seeing everybody here. So save the date and plan to be here. Okay, that's all the news and information for today. Stay tuned to all of our communication outlets for more information as it becomes available. So as we move into a time of worship, I want us to think about the last year. How have you been able to worship from home? Has it been easy? Has it been hard? We'd love to hear from you, honestly, because growth and ideas and inspiration happens in community. So either email me personally or simply comment in the chat and share what you've done to utilize this time in our services for the last year. But let's, now let's focus on today. What can you do right now? Maybe you literally sing out loud wherever you are. Maybe you read the words and sing in your head. Maybe you just simply reflect and use this time to kind of calm your mind and your spirit so that you can hear from God. However you worship this morning, place the distractions aside. The physical ones, the emotional ones, the mental ones, and focus on Jesus. Focus on his love. Focus on his love. We're talking about love in the series. Focus on his love for you. Be reminded of this truth that Jesus said, where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there. And, and then he also said that he will never leave us um, even to the end of the age. Church family, solo Christian family, he is with you. My hope and prayer is that you are reminded of that, that you will learn that, and that you just not hear that, but that you know that today. Will you join me as I pray? God, today, as we gather digitally across our region, across our province, even across our country, I thank you for each person that has joined. 
I think of family in southwestern Ontario that joins. I think of friends in Sogging Shores and Wyarton and even Niagara Falls. I'm, I'm reminded now of our new friends from Saskatchewan that join regularly. For our missionaries that tune in all over the world, God, I am encouraged. I'm happy and I'm excited that your name is being spread globally from this beacon of hope on the shores of Lake Huron. As we worship together, may our voices join as one, no matter where we are. God, I pray that your name is known wherever we are tuning in from. I pray for each family that is watching. I pray that they are encouraged by the words, by the message. I pray that they not just feel your presence, but God, I pray that they will know that they are known. I pray for healing across our church family. We pray for physical healing. God, through your miraculous powers, through leading the doctors, we pray for those that are needing a divine healing to be touched even today. God, we pray for emotional healing. The last year has been rough on everyone. And this morning we speak healing to minds and hearts and souls and emotions that need it the most. Even now, as we watch together, I pray for peace to fall on us. As we worship today, God, we come before you broken and damaged and far from perfect. But we know that you are a God that heals and you are a God that loves us. And for that, we say thank you. And for that, we worship you. Burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It's your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Burns in the darkness. There is a hope that washes the fear away. There is a peace that settles around us. It is your love that sets our hearts ablaze. Father, we're on. With every heart and feet we bring you this offering Lord come and fill this place Father we're crying out Spirit we need you now Glorious love surrounds us Lord come and fill this place Reigns in victory. There is a mercy strong enough to save. We feel it rising up from the ashes. There is a love that overcame the With every heartbeat we bring you this offering, Lord come and fill this place, Father we're crying out, Spirit we need you now, glorious love surrounds us, Lord come and fill this place, Father we're on our knees, with every heart Lord, come and fill this place. Father, we're crying out. Spirit, we need you now. Glorious love surrounds us. Lord, come and fill this place.
straight up highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back to sin, wake up the same. Let every nation shout at your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like the bride waiting for a room, will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, peace, even so, Lord Jesus. Faithful and true, Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sin, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming.
Let justice and praise become thy embrace to love you from the inside out. You will and all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing. Justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes and Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. I remember my 30th birthday pretty well partly because some friends of mine uh, threw a surprise party, so that made it memorable. And of course, I uh, got, you know, the kind of gag gifts you get on an occasion like that. But there's one gift that I received on my 30th birthday that I still have, even though we're now almost uh, 27 years later. And this is it right here. It is, as you can uh, probably see, it is a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey and yes I am a Leafs fan I'm a little bit mad at them uh, right now seems like I'm mad at them kind of every spring then we kiss and make up uh, before the fall and uh, this has kind of been our annual uh, history for well since like 1967 so this this is an official uh, jersey it was the uh, the CCM jersey that the Leafs were using back in 1994. This one is, is really authentic. It even has the, the tie down uh, in the back so you don't get jerseyed when you're uh, in a fight. It's got my name on it, which is cool, and the number 30. No, I'm not, a, I'm not a goalie. That's because it was my 30th birthday. And I thought that was a really appropriate gift because when I was 30, I was like, young and active and athletic and trim and all of those things. So this was a pretty appropriate gift. And then I turned 50. And uh, here's what my wife gave me on my 50th birthday. I don't know if you can see this uh, very well. Let me turn it on so you can maybe hear it. This, uh, in case you're wondering, is, is a nasal hair trimmer. Um, it can also uh, trim the unwanted hair in your ears. There's also actually an attachment on it uh, to keep your eyebrows from becoming these out of control uh, shrubs. Nothing says I love you like a nasal hair trimmer. I didn't need it when I was 30, but uh, apparently I needed it when I turned 50, perhaps even a little bit before that. Uh, I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of me, uh, like quite recently. And the next picture is actually the same picture, but it's what science says I'm going to look like in five years. Yeah, I know, right? Pretty uh, horrifying. The only word I can think of as I uh, see that picture is disintegration. Disintegration. And friends, all you have to do is just look around, like look at your, whatever you're watching on, your phone or your computer, your television, it's in the process of disintegration. Uh, you look around at the room you're sitting in and it's disintegrating. You look out your window, you might see, I don't know, your neighbor's house, it's disintegrating. You might see your neighbor, they're disintegrating. Look in the mirror, you're disintegrating. Um, we're falling apart. I'm. I'm falling apart as I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm literally decaying uh, before your eyes. Back at uh, the start of May, uh, around May 1st, uh, it, was, it was a month before I was gonna start here on June 1st, I thought, you know, it might be good for me just to drop maybe 10 pounds. Because, uh, you know, during COVID, I'd put on a little bit of weight, not the COVID-19 pounds that some people have put on, but for sure, uh, the COVID-10, I'm, I'm pretty sure I put that on. So I thought, okay, month of May, I'll drop 10 pounds. That'll be easy. I'll be trim and fit and uh, energized and ready to go at Sobel on June 1st. And so I began um, this pretty, uh, I don't know, consistent regimen of diet and exercise for the month of May. And I'm happy to report to you that uh, as of this morning, I am now only 14 pounds away from my goal. No, that is not uh, some kind of new math. That is just old math that uh, no longer works for me now that I'm almost 57 rather than 30 years old. I wake up some mornings 
and I've got aches and pains, and I have absolutely no idea why. Like back when I was 30, if I woke up with aches and pains, I would know exactly why. It was because of the tournament that I'd just been in all weekend, or the game, uh, the three-hour game of touch football. Uh, so I'd have aches and pains, and I'd know why. But now, aches and pains for no good reason, just for the heck of it. And then you turn 50, and you get a nostril hair trimmer uh, for your birthday. Oh, by the way, Father's Day is coming up. I think it's next Sunday. Um, you know, maybe that's an appropriate gift you want to give uh, your dad. Basically, it's a way of saying, hey, you're disgusting. Here's a nasal hair trimmer for you. Everything, everything you're looking at is disintegrating. It's a, it's a corrupt creation. But how did, how did creation become corrupt? Because God is the creator, and God is not corrupt. Uh, God is good. He's 100% good, and he's all loving. So how could creation be corrupt? And yet, here we are, living proof, right? We've got, uh, we, I've got hair growing where I don't want it to grow, and it's kind of not growing where I do want it to grow. I've got flab that seems immovable and aches and pains for no good reason. We know from God's word that the world was not created to be like this. Instead, the world was created by God to reflect the integration and the relationality and the beauty and the harmony and the glory of God. Father, Son, and Spirit creating the world so that every part of the creation related to every other part of the creation in a, in a pleasing, uh, perfect, harmonious way, perfect relationality, perfect integration. And God is a relational God. And love, as we said last week, love is his DNA. And love is his highest ideal. And everything that God does, he does out of relationship. And so God creates angels. And he gives them some authority. And uh, he gives them some say-so, some ability to influence things. And so God, in his creation, puts some pretty significant things under the authority of of the angels under their authority, and God wanted to partner with them in order to carry out his will in the world, doing all of this out of relationship. And so he empowers angels to have authority uh, over some pretty important aspects of creation. And his idea is, his creative intent, is that as the angelic realm exercise authority over certain areas in the world, they would do so under the overarching authority of God, and there would be this relationality. And so God creates humans, and he gives humans authority over the animal kingdom and over the earth, and his creative intent there was for humans to exercise their authority, their say-so, um, over the animal kingdom and, and over the earth in such a way that they would do so under the overarching realm of the authority of God. And so God would be Lord of all, co-ruling with the angelic realm on one level and co-ruling with humans on another level. Absolutely beautiful, his creation reflecting his beauty, his creation reflecting his relationality, his harmony, his, his peace, and his beauty, the relationality of God fully on display in creation. But unfortunately, um, you know, many of you know how this turns out because these created angels were created with volition. They were created with choice. You, you can't have love without choice, but choice means that they could choose against God, and many of them did. And there was this rebellion in the angelic realm, and many uh, of those angels um, rebelled against God, having been led by uh, one known as Satan. And so these rebel angels, these fallen angels, having made themselves evil, 
now use their authority at cross purposes with God. Instead of being those agents that reflect integration, they now reflect disintegration. They introduce decay and corruption and destruction into the cosmos. This an enemy has done. I want you to remember that phrase because we're going to come back to it in just a couple of minutes. And so uh, with this angelic rebellion, there were some pretty fundamental aspects of creation that became corrupted. And then human beings got sucked into this rebellion. They got sucked into this civil war. And that's really the story of, of Genesis chapter 3. The first humans surrendered our authority over the animals and over the earth, surrendered that to these rebel angels led by Satan. And so now the corruption that was in the angelic realm, the unseen corruption now becomes visible. It now becomes um, impacting earth and the earth is now corrupt. The, the beauty and the glory of God that was seen in creation while well, it's now been corrupted and the earth is being uh, run by rebellious agents, both human and angelic, who are now using their authority at cross purposes with God. This an enemy has done. Everything I just kind of laboriously explained there is summed up by the apostle Paul in one verse. He's so smart, um, I should have done this first. One verse. Romans chapter 8 and verse 20. And it says, for the creation, that's the, that's the Greek word kitsis. It refers to the, to the sum total of everything that has been created. The creation was subjected to futility. That's the New American Standard. The NIV says that the creation was subjected to frustration. The Greek word that is translated in the New American Standard as futility and in the NIV as frustration is the Greek word matiotes. It, um, and, I, and I heard Greg Boyd talk about this, and he gave an excellent uh, explanation of this Greek term, matiotes. It means depravity, uh, frailty, devoid of appropriateness, subject to decay, subject to futility, subject to disintegration. It means that something is no longer working in the way that it was intended to operate. It's subject to frailty, to disintegration, subject to matiotes. And so what this means is that in the creation, nothing works quite right. It, nothing works the way that God intended it to work. The creation does not reflect the harmony, the beauty, the peace, the relationality of God like it was supposed to. Instead, it reflects conflict and it reflects disintegration. Conflict permeates everything. The cosmos is, is this fallen war zone subject to matiotes. Everything is in the process of disintegration. Why is this world the kind of place that breeds cancer? It's because we're subject to matiotes. That's why. Why is this world the kind of place where there are catastrophic natural disasters? some of which kill children? Why are there so many diseases and plagues and famines and hurricanes and crop failures that just suck the life out of people? How could the creation become like this? Oh yes, thank you, Paul. It's matayotes. It's not the way that it was supposed to be. Something has gone wrong. There's depravity, there's a lack of appropriateness and Frailty and decay are everywhere. Disintegration. It's a corrupt war zone. Uh, Gene and I, once in a while, will watch uh, some animal kinds of shows on Netflix. And man, it is incredible how violent the animal world is. Well, why is the animal kingdom so violent when God is not? Well, Genesis tells us that the animals were originally created to be that way. It's been corrupted. Violence uh, now permeates the whole thing. The cosmos has become a war zone. It's not the way that it's supposed to be. So there's violence, there's corruption, there's, uh, there's disease. 
disease that affects innocent children. That's not God's perfect plan for your life. This an enemy has done. Why is this world the kind of place that breeds COVID-19? Where does COVID-19 come from? What is its origin? Well, there's sure a lot of speculation about that uh, these days right now, isn't there? A lot of theories, a lot of suspicion, a lot of um, finger pointing. So let me just say this, and I, 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 and I hope this doesn't sound overly simplistic, but whether coronavirus, COVID-19, whether it's just something that this corrupt creation spits out like it does cancer and hurricanes, or whether COVID-19 is something more uh, intentionally generated through fallen agents, whether human or angelic. Regardless, it's matayotes. This world is subject to matayotes, subject to depravity, to decay, to disintegration. This an enemy has done. Those words, uh, this an enemy has done, are the words of Jesus. They come from Matthew chapter 13. There Jesus tells a story, a parable about a farmer who uh, very carefully plants a wheat crop in a field and then he goes home and goes to bed and under the cover of darkness, a, an enemy comes and sows tares or weeds among the wheat. And then uh, as the wheat begins to, to grow, so too do the weeds and the, the farmhands go running to the farmer to say, uh, there's, there's weeds in the wheat. To which the farmer replies, I planted the wheat. I didn't plant the weeds. This an enemy has done. In other words, Jesus is saying, this world is not the way that it was supposed to be. The wheat of the father and the weeds of the enemy are now all kind of mixed together in this war zone world in which we live. And we see this on display uh, in the kingdoms of this world. We see this this on display um, in, the, in, the, in the politics of the kingdoms of this world. This an enemy has done. The kingdoms of this world are the playground of fallen angels and fallen humans operating at cross purposes with God. This an enemy has done. Where did those weeds come from? This an enemy has done. God is not the author of COVID-19. The God who looks like Jesus is not sitting up in heaven. Like he, the God who looks like Jesus was not sitting up in heaven in 2010 going, hey, Haiti, here's an earthquake for you. The God who looks like Jesus is not up in heaven going, hey, cancer for you, hurricane for you. The God who looks like Jesus was not sitting up in heaven early in 2020 going, hey, today's special COVID-19 for the whole world. No, this an enemy has done. And here's my concern. And this has been my concern, I would say, for 15 months at least as we've been in this uh, twilight zone of COVID. I'm seeing more and more Christians focusing on the weeds. More and more Christians focusing on the works of the enemy. More and more Christians sticking their noses in deeply to smell the rot of corruption, breeding fear and suspicion and anxiety. Please stop focusing on the weeds and start focusing on Jesus. Because when you focus on the weeds, you're actually being kind of sucked in, co-opted by the works of the enemy. COVID-19 is the result of a corrupted cosmos. This an enemy has done to bring disintegration. Let's focus on the Christ who brings integration. Focus on the, focus on the wheat and not on the weeds. Because focusing on the weeds breeds fear and suspicion and anxiety and division. And focusing on the wheat breeds love, unity, peace, faith, trust, and rest. Let's, let's reflect in our lives individually, and let's reflect in our church the integration of God and not the disintegration of the enemy. So we realize that the world 
is now not the way that it was supposed to be. But thank God he didn't leave us in that mess. He didn't leave us in the mess of Matayotes. God didn't give up on us. We read in the scripture how the, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, Jesus Christ became flesh, became human, and died on a cross in order to bring an end to Matayotes. He died on a cross not just to save humans, which is how most often how we think of it. See, the problem of evil is not just a human problem. And so the solution to evil is not just a human solution. The problem of evil is a cosmic problem. And so what is required is a cosmic solution. And Jesus, by virtue of his death on the cross, provides that cosmic solution. When Jesus died on the cross, it was about ending Matayotes throughout the cosmos and bringing peace. It was about defeating the principalities and the powers that now oppress the cosmos. It was about bringing reconciliation of all things on earth and in heaven as well. And again, Paul expresses this so much better than, than I can. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, we read these words. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. There's the God who looks like Jesus. And through him, that is through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. Notice this. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Bringing reconciliation to all things, making peace through his death on the cross. This is an amazing passage. Now, here's a question for you. If God has put an end to Matayotes, if he has reconciled all things in heaven and on earth by way of the cross, why don't we see the effects of that right now? If God has solved the disintegration problem, if God has solved the Matayotes problem, why do I still have hair growing out of my nostrils? Why do I still have flab that seems immovable? And if God has solved the disintegration problem, why is there cancer? And why are there pandemics? If God has reconciled all things to himself and solved the, the Matayotes problem, why then do we see beautiful, precious families being mercilessly mowed down on the sidewalk in London, Ontario. If God has solved the Matayotes problem, if he's reconciled all things, why are we discovering mass graves with the human re remains of 215 beautiful, precious children made in the image and likeness of God as a, at a res residential school in Kamloops? Those are tough questions. That's exactly where I want to start, by the way, next Sunday. So please come back for that. And we'll talk about, uh, next Sunday a little bit at least, about what New Testament scholars call the now but not yet. But um, let, me, let me close with this. Because you, you, you might be sitting at home thinking, uh, I thought this was forward together in love or something. I thought this was going to be a love sermon. This has actually been a bit of a bummer so far. This is kind of the prologue um, because we're never going to be convinced of the priority of love unless we're convinced about the problem, unless we're convinced of the need to live in love. So love is going to be our way forward. That's what we're going to be teaching on for 1 Corinthians 13, where love is both the way that we travel and the, the destination to which we're headed. Here's a question. Think, think about this. How does a church move forward together when we have so many wide-ranging and diverse opinions about all manner of issues? Let's, let's pick an example. Let's pick COVID-19 as an example. There are certainly lots of opinions about COVID-19. And you can find opinions expressed about that in our culture uh, expressed in rather divisive ways. I think we've probably all uh, experienced that. 
Some people talk about a pandemic, others talk about a plandemic. Uh, some talk about COVID as a, as, a, as a very serious public health crisis. Others say, eh, it's overblown, it's the flu, uh, no big deal. There's mask versus no mask. There's vaccination versus no vaccine. And these broad opinions, as well as other opinions about COVID, are held by Jesus followers as well. And they're expressed in the church. One of the things I love best about the church is that we can have a broad uh, diversity of opinion, even about COVID. And yet, we can be unified by the centrality of Jesus. Because even if you have uh, kind of diametrically opposed views about COVID to, to another Jesus follower, the very fact that we're drawn to Jesus at the center means naturally that we're going to be drawn closer to one another as well, even despite our varying opinions about other matters. The church is the only organization that I can think of where we can have incredible diversity, diversity of opinion, and yet one attitude. Paul said in Philippians 2, have the attitude of Jesus. We can have a multitude of opinions and yet have one attitude. I love being part of the church for this reason. And I, I love the diversity that exists, the diversity of opinion that exists in the church. It just makes church so interesting uh, to be part of. But the commonality of our commitment to Jesus at the center makes possible a beautiful unity, a beautiful singleness of purpose and attitude, even in the midst of our diversity. And Jesus specifically intends this. Jesus did everything short of hitting us in the head with a two by four to get us to understand this. He's intentional about this. And we see this in the Gospels. In, in Matthew chapter 9 and 10, in Matthew chapter 9, for instance, we read these words, and this is uh, Jesus selecting his team of 12. Matthew chapter 9, uh, beginning at verse 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, these are the religious people, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Matthew was considered scum by the religious people. Matthew was a tax collector. He was a Jew, and of course we, we realize that during this time, in this context, uh, Israel was, uh, had been taken over, had been occupied. There was an occupying, a hostile occupying force. It was the Romans, and the Romans were in charge, and the Romans had their foot uh, firmly on the necks of the Jewish people. And Matthew had the opinion that if you can't beat them, join them. And so he uh, began a, a career as a tax collector, which meant that he was considered by many of his fellow countrymen a sellout. They considered him treasonous. Um, and so Matthew would collect taxes for the Roman occupiers from his own people. And tax collectors were notorious for lining their own pockets with the excess they would... They would um, uh, take advantage of their own people, taking more than they were required to get rich themselves. Considered scum. Then you go to Matthew chapter 10, and in Matthew 10, you get the full list of all the 12 disciples that Jesus handpicks. He, in, he intentionally picks them, and you see all, all 12. I'll read this fast. There's Simon, there's Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, there's Matthew, the tax collector that we just talked about. Then there's James, Thaddeus. Then Simon the Zealot. Think about him for two seconds. Simon the Zealot. What is a zealot? Well, Simon the Zealot, he's, he's a Jewish guy, but he's the opposite of Matthew. Uh, if Matthew says, hey, if you can't beat him, join him, Simon is saying, I'll never join them. I'd rather die. Simon is probably wearing camo. He's willing to spill his blood on the streets of Jerusalem in, in combating these occupying Romans. He is, a, he is a patriot. His role and goal as a zealot is literally to kill as many Romans as he possibly can. And not only that, but to kill as many Jewish sympathizers, Jewish scum who are, who are 
working in sympathy to the Romans. In other words, he wants to kill people exactly like Matthew. And so Jesus says, Matthew, come follow me. Simon, come follow me. Why would Jesus intentionally choose two people with such diametrically opposed opinions? Here's why to demonstrate the power of his love to unite diverse people. And he did it to model for us as his church the power of moving forward together in love, forward together in unity in the midst of our diversity, because that is so incredibly compelling to our culture. Jesus said, by this one thing, by this one thing, by your love for each other and by your love for all others, by this one thing, will our communities know that we are his followers, not by our uniformity, but by our love for each other, despite our diversity and despite our varied opinions. The centrality of Jesus and the commonality of our love for Jesus is a bond so strong that it can bear the weight of a lot of differences that are of secondary consequence. Well, I can't wait to jump back into this next Sunday. I hope that you'll come back and uh, join with us. God bless you. See you soon. Thank you so much for joining us today. We want to make sure that as our online church continues in this format, that you feel like a part of us, no matter where you're watching from. We'd love to connect with you. So if you haven't already, you are very much invited to fill out an online connection card or just simply email me, andy at solidchurch.ca. I would love to hear from you. Also, we want to pray with you and we want to pray for you in whatever you're going through. We have an online prayer card available to fill out or again, you can just email prayer at solidchurch.ca. Stay tuned to all of our social media outlets for upcoming news and information. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you again next week.